Okay, thank you. So we are going to have a panel about uh, investing in games, and since the topic is kind of broad, we have we have people from both sides of the fence. So we have investors and game developers who have been successful getting investment. So if we start from the beginning of the list, first panelist is Yami from Future Play. And next one is Alexei from uh, uh, Epic Games. Is Alexei here? He's on, He's on his way. So then there's then is Ilya Karpinski from Mail.ru uh, Games. <clears throat> then Timo from Small Giant. And Yuli Chao from Yuzu Interactive. And the mics are on. And it seems to be that we are missing, missing one person, but let's start anyway. So could you please introduce yourself and, and what you do, and starting from the ladies. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Yuli Zhao. From, uh, I'm the uh, Senior VP for Corporate Development for Yuzu Interactive. Yuzu Interactive is one of the top five game companies from China. Uh, but among the top five, actually, we are the, uh, the, the, the one that has been expanded into overseas market the most aggressively. So like, two years ago, we acquired one of the largest European game company called Bitcoin. So uh, as you can see, we have been penetrated into the overseas market not only by our self-publishing capability, but also through our capital investment. So I'm really happy to be here today to share with you guys uh, more about our experience and all of our strategic thinking, and potentially we can form some cooperation in the future. Okay, hi, I'm, I'm Timo. I'm Timo Sonin. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Small Giant Games, uh, a mo mobile game studio out of Helsinki. Um, I'm one of the dinosaurs of the, of the games business, so to speak, been doing these kind of things for 18 years. Uh, I was the former CEO of Habbo Hotel back in the day. Um, uh, Small Giant has uh, been quite successful recently. We've grown incredibly fast. We were the fastest growing company in Europe last year with uh, grew from zero to $33 million in 10 months. Uh, we're currently at 130 million plus run rate in dollars uh, with our game Empires and Puzzles, which has been remarkably successful in the United States, especially here in Russia. We've been number one position many, many times. Um, and we're building sort of mid-core RPG games based on puzzle mechanic. Uh, my name is Lekar Pinsky, and I'm responsible for Mailer Games Ventures and Mailer Glossary Group. Uh, we run our 100 million funds one year ago, and already invest more than 10 game studios. Several of them is already very successful, like Peak Sonic or Beat Games. These studios are already announced. Some of these studios already achieve numbers like 100 million annual revenue. And we're looking for the new opportunities and looking for the partners with who we can create new companies uh, like Big Sony, Big Games, or some others. Uh, hi, my name is Yami Lais. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Future Play Games. Uh, Future Play Games is a little bit three years uh, over three years old. Um, our actually biggest and, and newest game is going to go global tomorrow, Battlelands Royale, uh, which is a very interesting uh, kind of take on the Battle Royale genre. And we focus on mobile. We've done previously uh, idle games with view-to-play monetization, focusing heavily on rewarded video ads as our main method of monetization. That's how we got started. But now we're getting into the kinds of games, what we want to build and what we play ourselves. Uh, I don't feel like a dinosaur, but I've been 18 years in the industry as well, uh, like Timo. Uh, this September, started as a game designer at Riot Entertainment in, in Helsinki back in 2000, and happy to be here. Okay, uh, one thing, could you please speak to the mic, because well, oh. close to the mic, so okay. to all of you equally. Uh, mm -hmm. Hey, since there is a couple of dinosaurs who actually admitted that they are dinosaurs, or almost admitted, so my first question is, if you think about your career or your time in the games industry, how has the investment climate towards the games, how has it changed? Or, or well, what is the biggest change you have seen in the investment climate towards the game and game developers in these 10 plus years? 
Yeah, I think obviously it's, it's the level of sophistication, you know, and I would say that it's like you have a couple of maybe three different categories. One is obviously angel investors who, who take, you know, enormous risks, you know, fright 50,000 to 100,000 or even smaller checks, you know, for early teams just on, in the hope of that they would uh, get something interesting going and then become rich in, in the process. Then you have, uh, you know, smaller VCs which are sort of slightly more sophisticated on that, but then you know, I think the the emergence of of analytics and the you know the the, the predictability of the business at some point, you know, the the top the top venture capitalists are actually super knowledgeable about about the you know, sort of deep a analytics of the games. You know, what are the retention curves? What are the monetization models? How are they sustainable? How do you do you know profitable user acquisition? So the big change really is that the level of sophistication, I would say. Uh, and then I would say that there was a period it was incredibly difficult, you know, back, way back then to get any money. That was much easier on the back of success of some of the, you know, companies like King and Supercell, um, almost like crazy days. And now it's getting very difficult for small teams to raise money because, you know, the rules of engagement have um, changed and it's very difficult to break through to, to any me me meeting, big meaningful numbers for, for a small team nowadays. So basically, you said that nobody uh, nobody fills lottery tickets anymore if, when you talk, talking about the investment. Everybody still wants to see the engine, wants to see, wants to see the numbers. Yeah, of course, lottery tickets exist, and they should exist because no one really knows. Always, some some small team, a small you know surprises, and you know actually reinvent something. But I think you know the 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 uh, how do you say the rules of engagement have changed that you know the even smaller teams have to show more than just an idea for the game they would they they are expected to talk about the business of games and it's a big difference so yami do you have some yeah kind I, of I, I agree with wisdom I, I agree totally with Timo that uh, how it was like 18 years ago and 10 years ago that that path that's gone through and yeah, the level of sophistication has, for example, risen in many European VCs who have uh, previously successfully exited CEOs and founders of game companies, etc. So that's kind of elevated uh, the level of sophistication on the investor side a lot. And I totally agree with the fact that um, nowadays, like, let's say eight years ago, is pretty easy in Helsinki. Hey, we have a mobile gaming studio. We want to start a company. Um, show me the money. And a lot of people would offer, offer you money if you had a good team. And even though the investors always say that they want to invest in teams, that's the most important, today it doesn't cut it anymore. Just having a great team is not enough. I mean, for example, for us, when we tried to raise our first round in 2014 at Slush, uh, I met one investor and gave my pitch, and uh, he thought it was a Ponzi scheme. Uh, he liked the, liked the team, but he thought that the business model would never work. <laughs> And a year later, uh, I met the same investor, and he loved it. Exactly the same pitch. But the difference was that in, in that year, we built it into a profitable business. So even though there is that level of sophistication, still in many ways, uh, the investors really want to see the traction. They really need to see that it actually works. So they're, in a way, taking less and less risks because there's more and more visibility, certainty, numbers, KPIs that you can look for and you can expect to be there to show that the company is actually doing something right. If you already have a good team, come to us. We invest in a good team. We don't need to wait like this. <laughs> in my opinion, it's not true because, yes, of course, uh, not true, like, you difficult to find the money. Of course, in the game business, you cannot find a lot of, like, venture funds, like on IT business or, like, food tech or some others. But a lot of sp specialized uh, venture funds you can find in Silicon Valley also, like in Russia, of course, we invest especially in the games, but you also can find some like funds in London, in some, like, I don't know, in Frankfurt and in some other territories. Most of the people looking for the good teams because if you already invest in the game, you need to understand if you want to uh, take some money from the market, you need to invest on the early stage because if you already have successful business, I don't need you because the game business is more or less profitable and high margin business. And if you start generate like more than a million a month, you already generate very good money and you can invest it again and again in new game development. And in this case, nobody, for me, it's very difficult. I'm happy to invest in a company which already generate like, I don't know, close to one million. But then I talk with the people who already succeed. Nobody needs my money. I also can provide some additional support like marketing tools and some other stuff, but no needs. In this case, I need to invest on the early stage. And what we are looking, first of all, we're looking for the teams. 
if the team already have good experience, for example, previously working like game designers, technic, you know, coders, artists, project managers, for me it's enough to start first investments. It, and a clear understand but the main difference if you want to develop the game for mobile platform at this moment or for PC or a console, it's very difficult if you're looking for 50,000. For, for me, it's not enough money to launch the game. Or it's really, I don't know, some very like independent game and you need to go to the developer or some other like indie publishers, a very strange game. For me, it's very difficult to understand how it's work after launch. But if you come to me with a good idea and good team and ask for like two, three hundred thousand, Yes, I can start make these initial investments and support the studio with any idea and share the expertise. No, I, it, this is my opinion. Yeah, it's not well, so well, bad <coughs> times. It's a good but time. But I guess the <coughs> first time I, 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 I have heard that somebody called <laughs> investor <laughs> sophisticated. So <coughs> congratulations about that. But you are uh, uh, another sophisticated investor. Did you have something in mind? Uh, so uh, before I uh, jump into this topic, I would like to learn more about the audience. So I see many uh, audience are from Finland since this is a Finnish game day. Uh, can I understand a little bit who of them are from outside of Finland here? Yeah. Oh, most. <laughs> okay. And how many of you are developing PC games? Okay, so uh, you, uh, we were talking about the trend of investment here. I actually, I started the uh, strategic investment ever since uh, browser game uh, phase. Uh, basically, th that is a very special uh, market uh, in China back to like almost 10 years ago. And then when mobile game pick up, we see that um, uh, also many browser game developers are also very successful in mobile game development. One thing, maybe change is on the platform. So but one thing doesn't change is a mobile game developer who who was browser game developer, they have a better monetization mindset. So I want to highlight a little bit here is a monetization mindset. No matter what platform you are doing. Because what I've been looking for uh, in Western developers, I found they have better quality of game design. They have a more strict control of the product design process than Chinese developer. But one thing specifically, I don't see that much in Western developer is a monetization mindset. That is very different because uh, I think creative is the advantage of Western developer and community management is very, very uh, big advantage of Western developer. But to make a successful game in the market still requires a lot of monetization mindset. And like our other experts just mentioned here, one thing also uh, change a lot in this market trend is that user acquisition has been more and more important factor to make the company and, and the game successful. So that is to say, we need to make the game successful enough to, you know, to afford the user acquisition cost. So this is a very important thing. Never changed, although past the ten years maybe there are profound change, there are general change. Doesn't matter. And the second thing is what really differentiate the team from the rest and the market opportunity. So like I just mentioned, when there are a lot of developers still focusing on mobile game uh, market, there are actually the blue ocean emerging in PC game. And I know that there are uh, a lot of PC game developers in Western market, especially in Russia, uh, especially uh, this is actually a PC dominated market. So when we see, for example, China market as an example, we see the mobile market has been really crowded. So before, like two years ago, three years ago, there are like 20,000 developers on mobile in the market. But now the market has been squeezed so much. So now there are only 600 developers in mobile game this year, right now in China market. The market has been over competitive and not all of them can survive in this market. So when, when we see the investment opportunity and also the, the, when the team started to make games, I really suggest you look into something different from the, the market. Maybe there are some blue ocean out there and your team has an advantage to tap into. Well, actually, if you think about Chinese market, do you think that the new regulation has something to do with, uh, with the decrease of number of developers in the market? The regulation which took place like a year ago in, in summer. 
Uh, I think it's actually not related that much into regulation. It's actually more on the business side. Uh, like I just mentioned, uh, the user acquisition cost is increasing like even double every year. So not all of the studio can afford that. And also, that also requires a higher quality of game design. So we, we see the market has been more and more consolidated into the top developers right now in China market. I think that's also seen the trend in global market. But of course, there are some emerging market, like Indian market, like, uh, like Middle East is still emerging. Yeah. Do you think that the, 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 the rapid growth of the UA prices, which we have been discussing quite a lot, actually, because it has been one of the hot topics, uh, is actually threatening the investments to the games industry? How do you all see this? Is, is it kind of phenomena which is which is in the future threatening the investor's willingness to invest to the games industry. Yeah, so, you know, for, for your information, so we, we raised a $41 million round with the EQT Venture of Sweden uh, about four months ago. Uh, and one of the reasons uh, for that investment was that we were able to show that, that equation that, you know, was talked about here, that, you know, that you, how to acquire users in a systematic, consistent way so that you know your user acquisition cost is much less than your lifetime value, creating this arbitrage. And I think this is exactly the situation that you know why a lot of early investors are who understand the business are quite discouraged about the fact that you know you. That's why what Yami mentioned, you have to be able to show certain unit economics and sort of model that you can actually scale. That there is a future for you because you know a lot of people are still relying on this magical hope that you know our game will sort of magically start you know Google features that and then all of a sudden it, you know it's it's not going to happen most likely and you know uh, few exceptions happen every there so you have to really work on the business of games and understanding that model creating a good enough game that there's good retention curve so the players love it the number one most important thing and second thing is you have to think about the in, in as part of the game design you have to really really think about the monetization in a sustainable way uh, otherwise, you really have no hope. Um, but you know, but of course, it can be done. I mean, we we were really struggling a couple of years ago with our first games. We didn't have those systems in place, and we said, you know, we need to crack it. And we, after hard work and uh, you know a little bit of timing, luck, and all that stuff, and then very persistent approach on marketing, we were able to do that. So basically, it's either economy of scale thing. If you are in a very crowded, saturated market like mobile games market in China, for instance, or then you have to find a new emerging markets markets to go if you don't have this kind of this kind of flood of money. Or in you your need back to pocket. create a good game. Mm. It's sometimes it's enough. You can talk a lot about user acquisition. Yes, it's like I don't know. I don't know how to say in English, but in Russian we have some words like yes. Everybody, if you want to, I don't know how to say like captain or there's something. Uh, but it means, yes, user acquisition is important on any plot platform, it's true. If you can generate traffic for, I don't know, 25 cents, potentially you are very success successful if you have a good game in any case. If sometimes, no, no, yes, of course, you need a lot of money for the marketing. But, for example, we launched our, one of our games like half a year ago, and the game immediately in the first month generated like more than 2 million in the rating without like big marketing push. It's because a good game. I know a lot of, like, the company with their short success, and a lot of company which spent like 10 years before success. You know, it's a life, in my opinion. Nothing changes in the last 20 years. In this case, on 100%. Every year, somebody has launched PUBG. I mean, new genre, new game, some unique product, and everybody goes to, for, you know, in this line, follow their leader, and lose a lot of money. But if you want to create something unique, create something unique on mobile platform, PC, or a console. I know a lot of studios who are very successful. If they trust in a game, develop good game. Of course, in in background, for anybody need to be business, you know, businessmen and some I don't know any entrepreneur ideas in a game. Or, this is in background. But if we talk about the games, create a good game. It's enough. That's all. Yeah, I would argue that creating a good game is not enough because, like, the, the worst strategy, business strategy in the world is is hope. Hope is not a strategy. Hope is just wishful no, thinking. No, but, you know, but, what I'm say, but I'm saying that good game. You obviously, you need to do a good game. But you know, if you don't have a, you know, you can't rely on the fact that it will automatically become viral in just a flight. That's not strategy. You have to build your 
good game in such a way that you have a sustainable <coughs> model that you know how you're going to get users if the magic doesn't happen. In 99.99% cases, it doesn't happen. So that's my point. I, mean, I agree that sometimes you know, we have a new studio that just basically creates something amazing. But for 99.9%, .9 that's not going to happen. So that's my point and be really rational about it and create that really good freaking good game with you know great retention good monetization and then you know you have a very good chance of becoming successful i i agree that a great game or a good game is is definitely the starting point for everything but a good game is only that it's a good game but what you need you need is a is a business so there's a lot of other kind of capabilities that you need nowadays in my my opinion to build yourself uh, like analytics, back-end stuff, and services, and user acquisition, and, and different kinds of um, uh, kind of back-end services and games as a service um, kind of features and functionalities and systems, depending on your game. I mean, we build our own ad mediation as well because we relied 75% on ads. Because if, if, if you're building a business and not a game, you've got to understand the business in a wider sense as well. And going back into the UA uh, discussion about the investments, et cetera, the kind of weird paradox is that once you actually get to that scale uh, where you have the, have the equation figured out and you can scale it with just by pouring more money into user acquisition, uh, at that point you're kind of at stage as a company where why would you trade equity for user acquisition? Because there's loan vehicles out there in the market, for example, that you can leverage for financial engineering into growing your business. But um, that, that's another topic, maybe, than, than yeah. this panel. I'm, I'm sorry, quick questions from here. So why do you divide a good game and a business? Yes, this why, is the why, same question. Why those concepts should be different? Yeah, they're not different. I yeah, say yeah, good yeah, game yeah, is yeah, at the core, exactly. but it's just the core, the hardcore nucleus. What is a good game? What do you mean by that? A good game that is, you know, something, well, for me, where a good game starts is that first, first of all, the game needs to be fun. It needs to be good quality. If it's fun and good quality, usually people actually enjoy it. That leads to engagement. Engagement leads to sessioning. It leads exactly. To I'm talking about business. That, that leads to monetization. And yes. if you have all that figured out from a game point of view, you will notice along the way that you need to build systems outside of the core systems of the game if you're operating a service and not a standalone paid product, one download, etc. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I, I agree, but I was just saying that business metrics can be actually criteria of how to define a good game. If uh, like the retention is high, apparently people come back and it's yeah. fun, right? If people spend money, I mean, this is the best they can do. They uh, spend their own money money you know on your game I mean what's better right it means that the game is good yeah. so I think they should not be you know different concepts I can add if they're you're not you, but you need to approach them differently yeah. good right. game alone is not enough that uh, no, no. Was a short additional like I don't know use mobile developers yes it's not PC console if you already a good game with a lot of fun and people not spend money spend time on your game in any case you can monetize this product that's what so actually that, Yanida does yeah, that's, yes. what I, that's what I said as well you just one thing to add. First. So um, no, we all see like PUBG is a good game, yeah. but we also see Fortnite is making more money than PUBG. It's very hard to say that PUBG is a <coughs> less superior game than Fortnite. But in the business world, we are talking about investment here. Investment is talking about business. So think about if an investor into look into your company, your product, which one they would prefer. So for example, Minecraft has a DAU of over 10 million in China market. I don't know if it's that number for global market, but that actually made it a great game. But compared with Roblox, who just raised the $150 million in their latest round. It's making over $10 million per month. What is a good business? What is a good game? Yeah, I guess that this, this is a topic we have been discussing quite a lot. And we have seen many different kind of companies making many different kind of good games. So we have seen uh, this kind of indie developers who tend to be quite small. They don't want to grow. They are making turnover, which is profitable for them. They are making their living out of the, out of the game they have created. And they have a fan base who lo loves to play the game and so on and so on. Typically, they are less than 10 people studios making turnover 
like two or three million euros. They don't, they don't need investment because they don't want to grow any bigger. And they have found their ecological spot in the games industry. They have found their economy of scale. And I think that this was something Ilya was referring, kind of yeah, this I kind mean, of economy of scale. If you try to compare Minecraft or Roblox, potentially it's a good compare, but you need also something, look on the history. Roblox spent like more than close to 10 years before they succeed little bit because like the company established more than like eight or nine years ago and first money they start generate only like two years ago and mostly successful only in last year then there's something changes and yes the audience start growing very fast it's a lot of audience they bigger than YouTube in this audience in US very successful but, but before that I tried to tell you know, to told you we talk about like very successful projects okay Roblox successful but they spent 10 years Everybody wants to invest in Roblox before success, succeed. After, it's not very interesting. Like PUBG, it's very successful, nobody trusts in the game, but they cannot support the game. This is the issue. It's not in the business model. It's because the company does uh, expect so huge success. And in this case, they cannot provide a good service at this moment. And they need to rebuild the company, and this slowly, of course. And they give for Fortnite possibilities to compete with them. Sometimes it happens, but it's not about the question about the business. It's a question about your success, successful, and you need immediately restructuring the business and find ways for this restructuring. Or some of your competitors come and take your money, that's all. Yeah, my, my, my view is that, that, you know, for a lot of developers here, that, you know, early stages where we were a couple of years back and how difficult it is, but I think it's just a Almost like, you know, it's a, it's a very consolating thought that, you know, it's only a question about mindset that you, what, what KP was referring that do, are we in the business of making just games and, you know, we'll make a living or uh, do we want to make something big that could actually be very, very successful financially? Uh, Obviously, everything starts with creating a good, having a great game design, having good technology, development side of things, having a great sort of artistic side of the game. That's like the nucleus, everything. But you have to think about, you know, the analytics. How do we understand the game? You have to understand performance marketing, that how can we actually, you know, get users or do, you know, influencer marketing or whether other free channels. But you have to have a marketing plan. Uh, and then you have to be able to do live operations. You have to be able to nurture the game, publish new features. You have to have a cohesive plan. Uh, or, or, and I would say it's a business plan rather than, than a game plan. And that, that's why it, all of these packages, all areas need to be together if you want to become something really, really successful. And I think all of the teams here can do it. Um, but you just have to have that. It's not that difficult, but you have to be aware of the fact that we, we need to do analytics. Quite recently, I had a conversation with one of the studios that, that, you know, they have a really good game as a start with, but they had absolutely no idea about analytics. And my prediction is that unless they crack the analytics part, they will not be successful because they don't know, they will not understand what's going on with the game and how to take it further. No, okay, maybe some difference because we provide for all our studios in which we invest analytics tools and all, all infrastructure to succeed, some success. Uh, of course, you need to have some analytics, but also if we talk about business, sometimes studio only 10 people create good game, they don't have enough money to develop analytics or enough time. And in this case, if you try it it, 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 it different way, yes, then you start your business, you have only like 10 people, I don't know, 50,000, you cannot spend a lot of money for analytics, for additional marketing research, and a lot of other stuff. It's also the question, but you you're already growing in success. Of course, a lot of other companies around you may be not very successful. Yeah. But at this moment, you already can spend a lot of money, Yeah, yeah but that's, that's not the point. The point is, that I, I would be interested to hear, what is the investment criteria? I mean, I've, I've worked with uh, 15 different very top VCs of this world. Uh, and, you know, the investment criteria, criteria for all of the top guys have been that you have to have a demonstrable sort of, a, you know, like attraction, as Yami pointed out, and sort of certain KPIs that you can make a projection that this good game can actually fly from an economic, econometric perspective that is going to be sustainable. Otherwise, it's just a matter of opinion. And we have, you know, 100 opinions in this room. I mean, whose opinion is the best? I mean, the only way to know whose opinion is best is to test and show, <coughs> and show some KPIs, which can be then, 
you know, calculated mathematically what it could be. No, I agree. We start um, in your yeah, yeah. production, you start from you need to test like split matrix or any stuff, you need to run the game immediately when you have something. Agreed. Yes, yes, yes. On one hundred percent. For me it's like like you just said, it's like it's like good game, it's already the name good game include. You try to organize what you plan to achieve at the end. Yes. If okay, you want yeah. something, you yeah. need to write this. Yeah. I think that this was kind of heaty topic. Can I have, <laughs> yes. can I have a quick? So we'll, can I have a quick, very quick, quick comment to kind of try to get this last you know, comment? Then we go to the next topic. <laughs> um, uh, interesting agreement into into mix. I think that you know, at the end of the day, whatever plans you have, or whatever uh, kind of goals you have, or whatever kind of metrics you have, they don't really matter unless you have the team who understands what to do with them. I mean, you, you've got to have the capabilities. There is no plan that plan would help you succeed. There is no metric that would help you succeed unless the team understands what to do with that, how to run with it, or how to improve something, or how to cut bait and do something else. I think that is there at the core, and that's what the investors are looking for. Have you figured it out as a team so that you know as a team what you need, what you can do, what you don't know, what you need to hire, what you need to build yourself, how to be successful, etc. And that is really hard to prove on, on slideware. That's where the traction part comes, that you need to kind of show some kind of first inclinations of that, that you will figure the rest out. You have the capabilities to do that. I agree, yes. yes. Okay, but this was Hiti's topic, so go, let, let's go to the next one. Uh, as you can figure out, investing into the games is not very easy for anyone. There is a lot of opinions, a lot of strategies. But Timo and Yami, do you think it's worth uh, to work with you know, investors who have no previous experience about the games industry? Because is there any su success stories uh, with the investors with no previous experience with in the games industry? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, in the early days when we did our you know angel round and seed you know early seed round, that obviously most I would say two thirds of the people have no experience. They, yeah, but but they, it was fifty years ago. No, no, that was, that was, no, no, that, that was four and a half years ago when we raised okay. out the, you know for small giant games. So, but you know you need the money to, in the beginning. It was we couldn't find mail dot you guys back then. So maybe we should have talked to you <laughs> earlier. But you know obviously it's it's helpful that you know if but you know for those people it's sometimes personal relationship or they, they they trust you as a team that if they see an opportunity these guys can figure it out that that's almost like the validation criteria at that point that it seems like a reasonable idea so but was it kind of extension of friends family and fools yes or sort of yeah the, instead the of the some people who have uh, say like friends and family or good good business sense i think the only thing to watch at that time is that make sure that the kind of agreements that you do that these friendly people turn turn out to be toxic people because I've, I've been in situations where you have really sort of early agreements are quite toxic and you know difficult. You know when you start growing, they they have too much power. You basically you know have to say, okay, we'll take your money while we put you on the side because that's our business. I think that's it's very important to negotiate that position. That don't be at the mercy of someone who doesn't understand your business. How about Yami? Yeah, in, in the case of Future Play Games, we, we only work with VCs and angels who, who actually have game industry experience, some more, some less. But uh, in previous companies where I've been, um, yeah, you can, you can kind of see that it's sometimes the detailed discussions get a little bit more difficult unless they have, have that expertise, et cetera, and can be um, a waste of time if it gets too detailed on the game design on the product and stuff like that. But this is, this is kind of the old world. I think in the new world, um, they do understand the, the unit economics, all the investors, and that, that's the kind of common language that uh, on the business side of things uh, can be understood by even uh, people who are not from games because you can show how the model scales and how, how the money is made, etc., and, and they can understand that. The kind of only difficult part when some of the discussions with investors who weren't from games uh, when we were trying to raise money, for example, was that how do you sell your company? How do you sell your idea to them? Because they don't understand your company or your idea or your team, and they don't know how to value the experience and, and the kind of experiences that you have had together as a team and stuff like that. So uh, we kind of tried to stay away from investors who didn't understand games, because at least we didn't need to uh, uh, go to uh, anybody who wasn't previously working in games or, or anything like that. I think it makes it a whole lot harder, and I think you're Timmy, absolutely right that then you have to have double security on it that you're you're covered in case that 
I'm not, kind of not understanding, not experience turns into toxicity or misunderstandings later down the line and you can still kind of do what you need to do for the company. So basically it's better if they understand what is going on, how, how the games industry is constructed. You don't have to explain if, everything from the scratch. If they want to be really involved, they need to understand it. Or if they don't understand it, they can be really involved. I think that's the way it goes. I mean, yeah. deeply involved on the board and operational yeah. discussions, having opinions and asking for lots of data and lots of details, etc. I think that is not necessarily toxic, but it can be just a distraction and a waste of time Annoying. that you don't need. Uh, that too, depending yeah. on what it is. Did you have something in your mind because you have... Now, uh, looking at people and offering them a microphone and если кто-то стесняется по-английски спрашивать, можно по-русски, я переведу. I offered my translation services. <laughs> for free, I understood that. Not for free, what are you talking about? It's business, not just, you know. <laughs> is it this kind of good translation? <laughs> it's this kind of in-app model. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right, so everybody is too shy, so you yeah, yeah. please continue. Hey, but uh, <coughs> one, of the, one of the questions which is quite often asked me that if you have no name band with no name brand and no name with no name team. I mean that if you have this very stuck kind of early stage startup game developer company consisting of juniors who might have a very good idea of a game or they think that they have a very good idea of a game, but they don't have experience, they don't they don't have a track or anything like that. Well, what would be your piece of advice for that kind of company? Where to start? I mean, looking for investment or looking for making business or whatever. How to, how to get started? Uh, so the first comment, I have need to be very honest. As an investor, it's also very, very difficult for us to, you know, to un identify those teams who haven't had have track record. So I would say if the team doesn't really have any track record. So we need to very carefully think about why we can succeed in this market with this team. So for example, when we, when we take Brendan, uh, the creator of, of PUBG as an example, he was actually a photographer and DJ before he entered into game business. So why he can succeed is because he truly loved this game the, the mod design for a long time. He's been doing a lot of mod since he uh, has been doing photographer. So that's why he knows this business, knows this kind of gameplay for a really long time. And he kept on doing that for DayZ, for H1Z1, and then comes to find his own studio. One angel investor, let's call him an angel investor, he's a VP of Bluehole, find, find this creator and advise him, how about we help you to find your studio to make a new game. So that's a true story when someone doesn't have any experience, but this guy, this game developer, actually know this kind of game development for a long time. And also, uh, let me tell you a very true story actually happened to me. A developer, a very small developer in German, uh, also doesn't have any experience. We talked about like two years ago about his, uh, his, his new thinking about making a game. They are, in, now they are actually pretty successful. They are doing an idle mobile game. But two years ago, he doesn't have any, he and his co-founder co doesn't have any track record. One thing they do, very different from the other team is that they don't have the experience in game design, but they do have a very clear mindset of what kind of game they want to make. And idle game happened to be a genre that is actually quite big in Western market, but nobody is doing that before they did it. So they succeed, and also they have a very clear mind of how to monetize the game. That is very, as I, as I mentioned before, that is actually very unusual in Western developers. So they succeed in that. So what I would say is that if the team, if we don't know, if we don't have any tracker, that's totally fine. But we need to think very carefully how we plan to do this game and why we can make it successful other than the other team. If we, you know, in the real practice, we, we don't have the very, you know, detailed plan to do that. When we, when we find a problem in the real practice, we, we truly, we can't think whether the team can deal with that in reality. 
From, from my point of view, advice for developers who have no name, have no brand, have no experience, uh, is to, you know, just start working on it. But try to align a few things. I mean, if you can align working on something that you love and something that the market might love too, and, and if those two are combined, that is going to be your unique selling point. That's going to shine through the first versions of the product that you're thinking about what you're building. I think Brendan is a great example. He's, he's the best, you know, kind of authority on, on that game type on this planet because that's what he loves, etc. So find your own kind of, not niche, but, um, especially. It can be a broad thing as well, but something that you're passionate about, that you want to focus on, and you want to eat noodles if, ha if you have to, uh, to get that done. And what I would do the next before, you know, going in directly into investors is to talk with other, other developers, talk with more experienced developers and ask their advice and ask their help and ask their endorsement and ask for feedback and advice on how to build your game and how to approach investors and build those relationships. Because if you can convince other more experienced developers that they actually believe in you, that you have what it takes to build that into a product that could be successful, they will make the introductions for you, for investors. And those introductions will be a whole lot more efficient than you cold calling investors or dragging them from, from their sleeve at Slush or, or in Finnish game day, etc. Because it is a, valid, a validated endorsement from somebody else that they trust, who has more experience. And it's like a pre-vetted, uh, introduction because okay this guy's introducing these folks i've never heard of these folks but if it's introduced by this guy then i want to talk to them yeah yeah maybe one one point you know having been there myself a couple of times with uh, other companies as well that, that basically i think you know in, in in that particular sort of a really difficult situation that you you have an idea you have the passion but basically ma make sure that you you actually you know for potential investors whether the angels or vcs that you show ambition level that you are not ashamed of the fact that hey my idea could actually become a really big thing because of this and this and this reason so that you actually show the ambition and then i think the other flip side of the coin is that also so humility that you know don't fall in love with your idea forever i mean you know it might be the big one but chances are it's going to be your third or fourth or fifth idea that's going to make it uh, so so basically you know once you have your idea you know hopefully you get the money by showing a big vision and then you know, start delivering and validating the idea. If the market feedback is that it's not going to go, don't fight against it. Kill it gracefully, quickly. Move on to find a new idea while you still have the money. I mean, this is this has happened to us. Happened to Supercell. Happened to Yummy. All of us. We've been doing it in the search of the you know the the perfect product market fit. So you know, ambition levels and humility. Oh, nice, nice mixture. One, one thing to add to that is, is <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> do, don't talk, traction. So if you have a meeting, whoever it is, if it's friends, family, or, or fools, or a potential investor, or another developer, if you say you're going to do something, do that and a little bit more before you meet them next time. Otherwise, they're only going to uh, consider you as a talker, not a doer. So if you don't show traction, don't bother showing up for meetings. No, yes, you need to commit like 200% of your time in this case. That's all. Only 200? <laughs> 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 Multiple on 10 people maybe, Yeah, like 2,000. Okay, uh, one, one of the questions is often asked from me also, this is for, for Yulia and Ilya, is that is there any investors for so-called serious or applied games? Are you making investments to the serious or applied games? educational games, health games, that kind of stuff. Mm. So, uh, so, so, uh, so for education, like the, the, the applied games, actually, uh, for us, uh, right now, we haven't been too much into that. But I want to say that there is also a very uh, emerging trend in the industry for instant games. Uh, there are a lot of developers are looking to the, into this area. So this uh, this kind of game is actually not only of for those games who has uh, income purchase or monetize directly from the game, but sometimes when you have a high D, uh, good enough DAU, you can also monetize through advertisement or something. So this is also an emerging trend. We'll definitely look into that. No, about us, basically we invest in education. If we talk about like whole group in services and some other stuff. But if you talk about games, I think it's already a good example. 
it's Roblox. In the basis of the idea, it's like sandbox with educational stuff, how to program the game inside the game. In my opinion, it's a great educational game in the world because in this case, it's, this game attracts a lot of young players, not only playing the game, but to create something from scratch. Of course, a lot of professional game developers already come to the platform and start developing some, something in Roblox. But if you have any ideas about like infrastructure, educational infrastructure, with the game experience, yes, it's interesting for us because you know, Roblox is a very good example. In my opinion, it's a serious game if you talk about no compare with that. Yeah, I, and I guess that Mojang uh, or Minecraft is still the most widely used educational yes. game in the world and it was not, not developed as an educational game but different kind of mods and different kind of yes. things have kind of transformed it so that it can be easily used for educational. No, in my opinion, also, in addition, I can also give you an example. Some people come to us and try to pitch the game like we want to create something like real, how to build real car from scratch with real physics, a lot of real stuff and so on. In my opinion, it's also the game contained a lot of educational stuff because uh, the creation of the products related to real car, real physics, real mechanics and a lot of other stuff. This type of the game can be very interesting and potentially can be very profitable. And of course we are ready to invest in this stuff. Okay, so it was the question for the investors. The next one, next one goes to the developers. Uh, how to find an investor? What, you, what, is, what is the most efficient way? Or is it going to the conferences, sending emails, uh, knowing them personally, or, or uh, introductions? Or what is the most efficient way of... of let's, let's think about this young studio, doesn't have too much experience. What they should do to find an investor when they have kind of figured out that now we have reached the stage that we are looking for an investor? Yeah, at least, you know, I think it's just good old hard work. I mean, just incredible amount of emails, finding, you know, names of investors from public sources, going to conferences, talking to, you know, other developers, sourcing names, asking for advice, and just, you know, creating this, you know, big funnel of starting with, you know, hundreds of names, you know, sometimes tens of names if, you, if you're lucky to, to qualify. But then you have to qualify that, okay, these guys are not interested at all, they hate you, you know, that kind of stuff. But, you know, it, it, is, it can be really time consuming or if you, if you, I really advise to you to, you know, to talk to Finnish developers, I'm sure Yami and I will be happy to help and point you to the right direction as well. But I think it, it is incredibly hard, especially for a young studio, because there's so many, there are, I don't know, in the ballpark of 500 to 700 new games still launched on the mobile platforms on iOS and, 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 and so many developers. So investors are also quite a bit tired about these ideas and they're looking for validation. But, you know, persistence is the key um, and these public sources. But Yami, you might have something else. Yeah, I, I think it is just hard work, but I think trying to get that intro, trying to get that meeting, trying to get that email, whatever channel it is, uh, you know, Ne never kind of lie or do anything stupid. I mean, always come come as you are, and you know, say say where you are with the product, and don't overpromise and under deliver. So, so really, it isn't just about like showing up and and cultivating those experiences and those those um, kind of connections and relationships. I mean, at least for me, it's always been something that I actually want to develop that over time because I want to vet the investors. I want to understand what they can do for us. Are they the right ones? Are they the wrong ones? Are they the best ones? Are they the right ones right now? Are they the right ones for the future, etc.? What are their kind of unique capabilities where they could be more helpful? But that's maybe second, second order things if you're looking for your first investment. But then uh, understanding the landscape, talking to somebody that who is your best bet or who are the most likely ones who are going to understand what you're trying to do in your region, in your stage of the company and your career and figuring that landscape out and then getting your foot in the door. It is hard work, but you just need to talk to people and show up to conferences and, and try to get a hold of those right people that you've identified as the ones you need to talk to. And then when you get that meeting, show traction, show passion, show you can do it. Yeah. You don't need to have all figured out and never lie that you have because nobody has. That's bullshit. Yeah, maybe one practical idea that, you know, even, you know, four years, four years back, we, we, I spent a lot of time 
wasted a lot of time because you know we didn't have a very clear let's say a, you know short list of the the people who really invest in games so we had to go through tens of vcs and you know investors who are literally not interested in games and in, it can take you weeks to sort that and you really try to look you know follow the you know the tech crunches and venture beats of these worlds and others you know you know the russian sources here that who are the investors who are actually interested in games and you know make sure that you come through those it sounds like a really obvious idea but we didn't it was difficult for us you know we ended up spending a lot of time and then one practical example is also that you know when you have a small team we we started with the six guys back in the day um, and you know i i literally was sacrificed to the altar of raising money and i disappeared pretty much from you know day day to day job for for the first six months because it was it's a full-time job raising funds and preparing the, the company and, and pitching like hell all the time. So never under, uh, underestimate the amount of time. So if you, if you have a team here that, you know, one of you will have to be sacrificed on the altar of, of, uh, of getting money. So it, it's, it's hard work. May I ask a question? Um, so when people outside the game industry ask me something about it, they usually, you know, imagine all of us like, you know, super rich people, you know, that have lots of money, you know, like, um, and unfortunately I have to tell them that, you know what, there are too many developers, there are too many games, and well, the majority of developers do not make any money, like at least, I don't know, 80% of all developers do not make money, and that's the reality. The question is, for all of you, do you consider games when investing your personal finance? Do you think it's a good investment field? I mean, would you bet your own money on that? Or do you have personal finance to invest? <laughs> yeah. Well, those rich ones. Yeah, I, I have done personal investments outside the company, yes. Because I think, you know, coming back to when the right, we have a good game, uh, which we talked about intensely. <laughs> yeah. So when you have the good team and you have the people who, there, there seems to be a sort of a believable and scalable model behind that. Yes, it, it can be very lucrative business. But of Was course... Was it successful? Yes, so far. So far. All right. Well, will you share your secret after, after that? <laughs> Actually, I think Julia just asked a very uh, important question. So when I look into the teams, uh, actually not to answer the question directly, when I look into the teams and the, the, uh, the startups, sometimes actually it's also very important the team, they invest their own money into the project. Do you believe in your project yourself? Sometimes uh, if, if the teams, we see actually some teams, they, they will love to invest their own money into the project. That actually makes a lot of things for us. This is a team who has a dedication. All right. I totally agree. And even in cases where you don't have the money to invest in your own company, your own project, uh, there's a big difference in people who are working in comfortable jobs and having a pitch deck and saying they're going to do it to people who have already quit their jobs and started doing it and show your prototype. So that's investing your own time and your own personal finances, not taking a salary anymore, yeah. but going at it already. That can be a personal investment as well. But to answer your question, yes, I'm invested in games for my personal finances as well. And yes, it's been successful. Cool. No, we regularly ask like 30% need to be invested by the team. And if we talk about seed round and other 70, we can invest from us. We regularly ask the people who start business from scratch but, need to yeah, put yeah. some money. If about me personally, yeah. no, I, invest, I cannot invest in video games, but I'm the bigger investor of the board games in Russia. Okay. And continue investing in any stuff related to around the games personally. Right. About this stuff. Thank you. To answer your question, actually, uh, before I joined the, uh, this company I said, for the couple of women, I did some personal investment, some failed, some successful. Uh, but as right now I'm doing the social investment for the company, actually there is a conduct, uh, we, can, we, can't, we are not allowed to invest in our personal money into the same industry. So. Wow, interesting. Yes, this is the issue. <laughs> it's actually <laughs> some conflict of interest. Yes. Right? Otherwise, we would tend to recommend this company we invest in with our personal yeah. money. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we don't have much time left for this panel, but maybe uh, someone has a question. All right. Thanks. Good day for all. Uh, I want to ask uh, what's the primary thing in team for investors? I mean, uh, you need more team with good skills and uh, good uh, experience, always interesting and unique projects. I mean, uh, on what team should focus more? 
on develop their skills or on finding interesting projects. Can I answer that? Always your skills and your experiences, because you never know if your project is going to make it or not, or if it's going to be successful. If that project fails, all you have is your skills and your experience, right? But prob well, probably the question is that what is more attractive for an investor, uh, like more skilled team that might make a good game in the future, or an already promising, I don't know, better version of the project? Was that the question? Yeah, but I think uh, we already hear on the analysis. Okay. You just seem so puzzled. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And of course, if we are talking about human beings, as we are talking about game developers as human beings. So basically investing in your own skills. If it doesn't benefit you today, but it might prove to be very crucial in the future. And in that sense, investing in skills, I guess that it was very wise advice. Thank you, Jan. Well, uh, I don't know. I mean, if there is a team that I'm managing, for example, of course it's great if, you know, my people are super skilled and, you know, uh, get more skilled every day, but, uh, you know, I kind of expect a result, you know, uh, which would be that great project. Yeah, but skills create results. Not, I think it's Don't. an answer, it's, it's like we, want, we, we prefer to invest in the stable team, because, yes. of course, not every game can be success. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you fail, sometimes success. But it's very important in game development, and it's this, the biggest difference with other industries. And it's a big problem for any investors. Sometimes we need to wait like 10 or more years before their team success. Just keep investing, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it's sometimes, I know a lot of VCs because it's out of their fund time frame. Yeah. It's impossible to invest if you have fund like, I don't know, eight plus two years and you need to wait like 10 years before the team successful, you don't start investing in this industry in any way. But in game development, a lot of teams achieved the successful after 10 years of a lot of experience, experiments. Of course, through the, all this experience, the skills grow faster, but you need to fight with the, I don't know, in the development with the industry to achieve the good success. There, there's a good saying that uh, overnight success takes a lifetime to prepare. Yes. So. <laughs> okay, uh, so it was so sweet. sweet. Uh, yeah. It in English. yeah, so if we have one more question. Yeah. No, then it's yeah. your last question. Yeah, Anders. well, actually, I don't have a last question. <laughs> I have some remarks. <laughs> so I have made some remarks right. or some, some things for... Or actually, after that, I will ask the last question. Okay, then you okay. will ask that. <laughs> so, so some kind of uh, remarks to <clears throat> myself, and I have a couple of words. One of them is emerging markets, which popped up. So go to the emerging market, you don't have to always go to the most saturated market there is. One word which was quite constant was persistence. So you have to be persistent what you are doing and you need to have passion because passion was like four or five times. We talked about, a lot about the data numbers proving the concept uh, that actually you are, up, uh, you are doing something right if you have the good numbers and you can see KPIs and retention and so on. There was, uh, I think that Timo mentioned humility a couple of times. Uh, somebody said, uh, it was Timo again, I guess, kill your darlings. So don't get, don't fall in love to your own game. Because if the market doesn't seem to go, seem to be going to that direction, you have to be also able to fail fast. We had a long discussion about the good games, which is, in my humble opinion, in the core of the games industry, and that's the reason why I didn't mention it, because I think that nowadays in this market there is no, uh, there is no chance to succeed without a good game. Uh, honesty, well, honesty was mentioned by Yami, to be honest, when you do things with investors and when you do things generally in the games industry. One of the things I really loved was this hard work, hard work. There is no golden ticket for anything. There is only a lot of hard work. 
And, and one of the things we discussed it was uh, when talking about the business and being really big, being, being really successful was the economy of scale. So these were my takings of this panel. And now it's time for Julia. Yeah, so I have question. to warn you, I have a very stupid question, uh, but, but I kind of liked it. And uh, I will still ask it, okay, after all the smart things that Kubi said. So, um, but please do not give me answers like, uh, you know, it depends. A game should be good, whatever. Depends. So, yeah. <laughs> so we got this question from our readers um, on the app to top dot you, the Russian website, when we published the information about the panel. And uh, so the question is, if you had one million dollars to invest, which genre would it be? One game only. Name the genre. Battle Royale. Yeah. <laughs> Unexpected. No surprise. <laughs> yeah. All right. And maybe platform too. Mobile. Uh, it's going live tomorrow. <laughs> cool. Ilya? Mix survival and some casual mechanics like Ma 3 or a hidden object. And platform? Mm, mobile and console. Oi. Mobile, uh, Math 3 RPGs, uh, Empires and Puzzles. <laughs> Uh, one million dollar, that's very hard to answer. Uh, I have actually different genres, but if name one, match three on mobile. Match three on mobile? Yes. Wow, I like your answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Thank uh, you. Let's give a big hand to the camera. Thank you, sir. Thank you.